Psalm 119, verse 103, King David wrote these words. How sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Y'all, I've got the biggest sweet tooth of all time. I'm a type 1 diabetic, been a diabetic since I was a kid, and I have a huge sweet tooth. Y'all know who this is about me. Uh, I love this verse of scripture. How sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Church, the word of God is sweet and it and it's nourishing. Honey is a good healer. It is great for you to have pure, natural honey. It is good for you, it's nourishing. A scooping handful of honey from a bee's nest is a beautiful, tasty thing, but it can also be dangerous and painful. Am I right? If you were to just walk up to a random bee's nest and shove your hand in there, yeah, you'll get some good honey, but you're also going to get caught off and stung a thousand and one times. In today's topic, can folks show be one of those dips into the bees' nest to get the pure honey from God's word? It is beautiful, it is delicious, it is meant to be followed. However, it can rumble up some bees. I can promise you that. I pray we can receive the nourishment that God intends for us to receive from today's section of 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you've got your Bible, you can turn there. We want to start off around verse 8 in a little while, but we'll get there eventually. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, was, we can go through this section with undue conflict or misunderstanding. For some reason, there's become this battle of the sexes. Ever since that famous tennis match years ago, there's this constant battle of the sexes between men and women. But that ain't the way God intended when he created man and woman. He meant for us to be partners, companions, helpers, where we meet each other's needs. I can tell you right now, there are things my wife can do that amaze and dumbfound me because God designed her that way. And there's things that I can do that she can't. We truly compliment each other. If you have ever been in a relationship, you can give a resounding amen to that, right? You know, for fact, there's things that the opposite sex can do that you can't, and there's things you can do that they can't. It shouldn't be a battle. It should be when we compliment one another. God intended for us to help. God created us to be two distinctive parts that complement and complete each other. From the get-go, as soon as creation was done, God said, it ain't good for man to be alone. He needs a companion, a helper suitable for him. And that's out of the camera paraphrase. You won't see the word ain't that often in scripture. So that's the camera paraphrase version of Genesis 2, 18. If we could do an open-minded, unbiased, comprehensive study of scripture concerning God's intentions for men and women, Y'all, we'd be able to conclude that God created men and women both equally, but with unique and different roles and abilities. But it is hard for us to be open-minded at times, ain't it? It's hard for us to be open-minded and unbiased because of our own personal desires and the effect of the culture around us. Even though we know that we live in this world and we're not of this world as called to the church, we still allow the world around us to lead us and guide us. God's word reveals these truths about the roles of men and women. One is that God has created men and women both in his image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female. He created them. Male, female. That's all. God created men. God created women. And he designed them specifically as he desired Men and women are equally valued in God's sight because both reflect the image of God. The Bible also shows how we are, uh, all who are in Christ are equal in value and spiritual benefits. In the book of Galatians chapter 3, we see you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, Male nor female, for you are all, how many? One. one in Jesus Christ. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Paul's point here is that one another's gender, nor race, nor societal status restricts you from the salvation or spiritual gifts that God has planned for each and every one of us. We are all one in God through Christ. We also clearly see that God highly values the ladies all around us. God has always highly valued women. They've always played an important role in what God desires for accomplishing in this world. From the very beginning, he was the first wife, the mother 
of the human race. You see this in Genesis chapter 2, 3, and 4. Deborah was a judge for Israel. You can read about her in Judges chapter 4. Ruth was a noble person, and her son was the grandfather of King David. Ruth chapter 4. It was Esther whom God used to save God's people from Haman's evil plan to kill all the Jews. Read the entire book of Esther, and you'll hear all about it. Consider the impact of the mothers of Moses, Samuel, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Consider all the women who helped Jesus and his disciples in Mark chapter 15. These ladies are strongly committed in Mark 15 for all the work and help that they gave. Consider all the women who were at the Jesus, uh, with Jesus as he died on the cross or at the tomb in John chapter 19 and Luke chapter 24. I mean, shoot, church. The first person to witness the resurrected Jesus, the first person to talk to Jesus when he arose from the grave was a woman. It was Mary Magdalene in Luke chapter 20. Think of all the women who were commended in Scripture for their service, their support of the church, the many women who had churches meeting in their homes. It's plain and clear to see God values women, and so should we. God values women, and they always play a vital, important role in what God accomplished in the world still to this day. A final thing the Bible makes clear is that God always assigned the role of primary spiritual leadership to men. Why? Because that's God's plan. That's the only answer I can give you. It's not Cameron's plan. It's not your husband's plan, so don't take it out on us later on after the service. I can't believe that. It's actually said all that stuff. No. We're looking at God's word, not any man's. It's God's plan. So please hold us accountable when it comes to leading and loving. Uh, when it comes to sharing, as God intended, hold us accountable so that we can be the men that God designed us to be. From the very beginning of creation, God made Adam, then Eve. He could have made Eve first. He could have made him at the same time. But God, in his own design, and his love and leading, designed man to be the stronger spiritual leader. And sadly, we are failing. More ladies lead their families to church, to worship, and around God's word than men. Throughout the Old Testament, men were always assigned to be the spiritual leaders of their families. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all led their families. God designed and instituted that specific men were to be priests in the temple. Of the twelve tribes, only one tribe was chosen to be the spiritual leaders in the temples, even. So we see that God has this set plan. We see the role of elders and evangelists, preachers in the New Testament, assigned to the role of men. Why? God's design, not Cameron's. I can't answer all the questions, but it's God's plan, and I need to talk about it. We see biblical examples of females in the role of deacon. In uh, Romans chapter 16, Paul commends Phoebe, a lady who steps up in her community and she takes on the role of deacon, which we'll see in a couple more weeks. But this role right here, the reason she did it, you really want to know the reason Phoebe stepped up as the role of deacon? Because the men wouldn't. She stepped up when the men were failing to do it. Even in Ephesians chapter 5, we see that men are to lead their homes. Women are called to submit to their husbands, and husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And I love that whenever I do premarital counseling, I will have wives or ladies say, uh, that ain't in the service, is it? <laughs> Why not? We have this idea of this word submission means like an MMA fight where I have to tap out, oh, you're the one in charge, not me. Oh, man, thank you, sir, for letting me stay at home. No. If you read that passage, wives, submit to your husband, and then it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Amen. What did God do? What did Jesus do for the church? He died. He fully submitted. Did you know nowhere in Scripture is a wife called to die for her husband? What the heck? Nowhere is a woman called to die for her man or to die for her children. Nope. But men are called to be willing to submit fully. They are fully submitting. So ladies, don't get offended with the wives. Submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives. Because the husband is called to die for them. You ain't got to do that again. So here, stay. We'll do it. When it comes to men and women, it matters not what I think. Can I say that again, sir? When it comes to men and women, both that God has designed, it matters not what I think. God couldn't care less about James Cameron Bailey's opinion. He is the designer. He is the creator. He is the one with whom I follow and to whom I listen. Not myself, not society, not social media. God and God alone. Y'all, it is vital for us to allow the word of God to say what it says 
and for us to follow it, whether we like it or not. There's parts of Scripture, as the preacher, I'll confess, there's parts of Scripture I don't really like. I don't even agree with it. But guess what? It matters not what I think. He said it. That said it. All right? In all honesty, I can't provide an exhaustive answer to all questions in one sermon. But today, we're going to examine one of the more important texts for this topic of roles of men and women. I, I love expository sermons. Expository sermons is where you take a passage of scripture and break it down and see what the original language was, the original meaning, <coughs> what the context is. This type of sermon is where you truly dig into the passage and see how it still applies today. One of the reasons why I preach expository sermons is to force us to deal with certain topics and topics that we might otherwise avoid, either because they're too difficult, they're too controversial, because we enjoy easier, lighter, or more popular topics. You ready for me to <coughs> How many sermons have y'all heard on the role of women? Exactly. How many sermons have y'all ever heard on the topic of sex? Here you have, we did that years ago, a few years ago, and it was extremely awkward, but it was beautiful and glorious, y'all. You know, there's things that we just don't talk about in church. Let's get to the easy stuff. No. God designed us to go through every part of it. So here's some passages that if you want to check out later on, we're not going to get into these passages, but if you want to write it down, if you really want to dig in on this topic, then here's some passages for you to write down, and as always, Read these sections before, not just those little verses, but before and after you get the full context. And then call me, catch me, set up a time for us to meet so that we can talk about it more, so that we can grow together as we study God's Word together. Genesis 1 through 3, chapters 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 16. Uh, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 36. Galatians 3, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, Titus 2, 1 Peter 3. They should be on the screen. Y'all write these down if you really care. You have a blank slate today. Write your notes. Take a picture. Oh, look at you being smart. Take a picture. That is so smart. Screenshot. Boop. Hang on. Write a thing down. I'm so much smarter than my preacher. I just take a picture. I'm not going to my hand right Write these down. And even though we are a third of the way done this morning, let's uh, make a few observations about women in society and in the world today. Women are a gift. The gift of women is what we're talking about today. These days, ladies have become more liberated than restrained. Many doors, once closed to women, have been swung wide open. Women can be doctors, lawyers, CEOs, Supreme Court justices, and presidents, as well as welders, construction workers, farmers, plumbers, and all the others that you wish. I love whenever I hear on the news people complaining about equal pay and everything. Uh, we don't really see many ladies desiring to be a welder or a plumber or a septic tank worker or anything like that. I'm not a lady. You can do anything you want, please, by all means. Take these jobs home. Look back at these days. These days, women have become more liberated than ever. Today's time period, ladies have a choice uh, where their counterparts, a thousand, a hundred, even fifty or thirty years ago, never had the opportunity to do. Women are no longer forced to stay at home. Although a friend of mine posted it or shared a post recently, and I thought it was hilarious, about a, it was a young lady who said, I want to go back in time and find the women who fought to give us the rights to work outside of the homes, and I want to slap them, because all we're going to do is stay at home. <laughs> I love it. And I hear some of y'all laughing because y'all think it's funny, too. I love that idea. And I've shown it to you by four ladies. I did. Even within church realms, there's a mass divide and some extreme changes have happened over the years. As a result, these changing cultural trends and attitudes, women in the church are sometimes more confused than informed. I am amazed at how many churches, colleges, seminaries have abandoned biblical truth about the role that we should play as men and women within our within our cultures and within our churches. Some Christian groups are telling women, you can do whatever you want, no man can hold you back. And then you have other Christian groups who are saying, whoa, 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 a woman can't do a thing. And they're both wrong. They're both wrong. And there's this fine line in the middle that we are avoiding because we don't want to offend and we don't want to upset anybody. Some Christian groups are telling women, do whatever you want. Others are saying, you can't do anything, and they're both wrong. So for these reasons and more, we need to listen to the only absolutely reliable voice of truth, the Word of God itself. 
With all that preliminary discussion now covered, let's dive into this morning's text. As always, the context of a passage gives us our bearings. This letter was written by Paul to young Timothy about the conduct of the church in Ephesus, the Ephesian church. This was written to the conduct of the church, not society, not what your neighbors were doing. This was the conduct of the church family. Paul is writing young Timothy to instruct them on how to protect the family of God, how to protect this house as we've been doing in this series of 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul says that he wrote this letter to Timothy so that he might know how people are to conduct themselves in God's household, the church of the living God, the pillar of the foundation of truth. In chapter 2, Paul has been addressing prayer. We looked at this last week and actually for a little while, telling Timothy to pray uh, for men in verse 1 because God desires men in verse 4 to be saved. And as I pointed out last week in that sermon, the Greek word used in those two verses, verse 1 and verse 4, for men, uh, is the word anthropos, and it is the generic word for humanity, mankind, is what that verse is talking about. Paul then came to, uh, in the earlier verses of verse of chapter 2, to verse 8. And in verse 8, we saw last week, we ended last week's sermon looking at this, where Paul switches terms in the Greek language to when he says the word men in verse 8, he uses the Greek word andros. Andros. And that word is different. Uh, everywhere, he says men everywhere to lift up their holy hands in prayer. The word he used, andros, in verse 8, specifically talks to adult males. Adult men. So starting with verse 8, Paul goes from generic stuff for the whole church family to very specific groups of people. Where he's talking to men, and then he's talking to women, then he's talking to the elders of the church, then he's talking to the deacons of the church. But there's something we can all learn from all these groups. So if we're going to take our time over the next few weeks, we're going to look at each different group all along the way. Paul today, when we talk about men and women and how women are a gift, Paul wasn't trying to discourage women when he wrote that verse. He was not trying to discourage women in general. And I have heard it said before, when he calls the men to pray, as women aren't allowed to pray. Ladies, you have a desire to pray in church, you let me know, and I will gladly set it up because I think some of the most beautiful prayers have been from moms and grandmothers over their families, over the church family, and over struggles. I love the emotions, the passion. I love it. So that's not even close. To say that Paul is saying here only men can pray, he's not telling the ladies to not pray. That's not at all, not even close. Rather, he's urging the men to step up their game in leading the family of God. So he's not knocking women, he's actually bashing men here. After telling the men to step up their game and to pray for the church family, which, let me pause real quick again before y'all get offended, and let me offend you a little bit more. What Paul is saying here, men, males, adult males, so if you're under 18, apply this to you too, okay? Just, you're a man, you're a man. When Paul says here, let me pause real quick and ask you this, men, do you pray for this church family on the daily? Do you pray for your elders? Do you pray for your minister? Do you pray on the daily for the spiritual well-being of your household and your family? Do you open Sunday morning before coming into worship to pray for this church service that God will move, that the Spirit will be on fire that day from heaven? If you answer no to any of those questions, Paul's talking to you to step up your game and be the man God desires you to be. You hear me, men? We need to be the spiritual leaders. And you cannot and you are not the spiritual man of God if you're not praying for your church, your community, your family, your household, your all. So men, make it a constant in your life to pray. Pray, pray, pray. And the lifting of holy hands, as we saw last week, is not necessarily me praying like this. I will pray sitting down. I'll pray while driving. If you pray while driving, guys, I know we're slow at times. Don't close your eyes, all right? I, I shouldn't have to tell you that. Don't close your eyes. You can pray with your eyes open. Did you know there's no set standard in praying? Oh, in church, they always stand to pray. Do you know why people stood to pray in church? So you could hear them. It's hard to hear somebody. You can have your hands together. You can have your hands apart. Your hands can be in your pocket. You can be sitting on your hands. Your hands can be holding your wife that you're praying for. Woo! You can be sitting down, standing up, kneeling, or face on the ground. It doesn't matter. Men, what I need you to do is pray. You pray for this church. 
You pray for our family. You pray for our leadership. For more than anything, men, if you're not praying for your spouse, for your girlfriend, for your children, for your parents, if you're not praying for your household and your family, step up the game and be the man God calls you to be. All right? We good? Let it work. All right. Paul then went from that. Man, we... I can't stand it. I like us to I, I preach to myself. Paul then starts in verse 9 by giving some instructions to the ladies. He wrote these words, verses 9 through 12. Also, the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing, with decency and good sense, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess to worship God. A woman is to run quietly with full submission. Do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Instead, she is to remain quiet. Let's make an awkward pause right here, okay? So what does Paul say is expected from the women? A few things. First off, he starts where I love that he started here. He says women should dress modestly. Now, some of you might be thinking, uh, is that the extent of God's concern for women really to preach her? <laughs> He's just worried about what I wear. He's just worried about his sin. I hear it. I have heard it. God is not really just concerned about what you wear. My response to such a question is to say that God is only concerned about what you're wearing is by me saying, well, in the verse, ahead of this in verse 8, he's only concerned if men lift their hands or not when they pray. No. That's a, a small aspect of this. Uh, in verse 8, when he was talking about men lifting their hands, that's talking about lifting your life up. So the modesty thing is not just with your dress, but with your attitude and your whole demeanor. The one point God's concerned about is the artificial glamour of the world and the beauty of that God designed. Ladies, can I just tell you, whenever I see my wife put on a lot of makeup, you know, one of the first thing I tell her is go, hey, don't wear that mess. God designed you perfectly the way you are. He did. I'm telling you right now, my wife, woo, I was going to show God designed her perfectly. She doesn't need all that extra stuff. Does it make her feel good? Sure. But I love her just the way she is. She is so perfect. Just as she came out of her mom. It is so awesome. Well, now that she's growing up, that got a little weird. <laughs> you see, if the Ephesus, the Ephesian church that Timothy is preaching, that Paul's writing to Timothy, the Ephesus church was the wealthy commerce center of all around them. Women were so much competing with each other that every woman in the community had to have the latest, the greatest fashions. They had to have the fanciest, the gaudiest jewelry. They had to be the ladies at church that had the biggest hat that got in the way and you could see around it. They had to stand out and so that people would see them so that they could become more popular and draw attention to them. Now, we know for a fact that women no longer compete with other women when it comes to fashion or dressing up or trying to outshine anybody or going out. We know you couldn't care less what other ladies are wearing and it just as long as you look fine, you don't worry about anyone else. We know Women no longer compete with each other. Right, church? Amen? So we know that this evidently doesn't apply to us today. Yeah. So Paul is telling them, when it comes to worship, set the standard. You're not in competition with everybody else. When we come to worship, this is especially talking about the church here. And that day, expensive hair years away with costly jewelry, you had to be at the top of your game socially. Paul's point very clearly here is that women should adorn themselves modestly, especially, he says, when it comes to worship. Church is not a fashion show. Paul is saying, when you come to church, it ain't about you. When we come to church, who are we here to worship? God. Who are we here to sing to? God. Who are we here to pray to? God. Who are we here to call and draw our attention to and to hear the word of? God. It ain't about us. Worship is not about us. We are not to draw attention to ourselves. And this is actually leads into the next section when he's talking about being quiet. He's talking about sitting back and listening and growing and learning. He's not saying, sit down and shut up. That is not what Paul is saying. Please, we have heard it wrong for years. He's saying, be the follower you claim to be in the way you act, in the way you dress, in the way you carry yourself. Worship. Church. Is about God and God alone. Did you know that heaven is even about God and God alone? It's not about what mansion I get or me walking my streets of gold. No. It's about me humbly falling before the God that created me and worshiping him forever. 
The godly woman is not trying to turn worship into a fashion show. She is there to worship God. She's not there to gather attention to herself from other women or from other men. And she certainly doesn't want to hindrance any man by dressing provocatively or to the poor by looking at all of the expensive stuff I got. Well, I wish you had a sandwich to eat today, but look at these fancy high red clothes and high clothes and everything else. And before we jump on the well, it doesn't matter how I dress. Men just need to behave and not look. Ladies, men are carnal. Men are carnal. When I do premarital counseling, I let men and women know that men are visual-oriented. Women are sense-oriented. Men see it and want it, period. You can fuss at us all you want. That is just the way we were created. I'm not even going to apologize to it, because I'm going to tell you right now, whenever my wife walks by me, mm, I let her know how I feel. You know, she, she's awkward. Women are sense-oriented. The hand on the small of her back leading her into a room, especially a room with other women, to let them know this one is mine. The note on the steering wheel that says, I adore you. The words of, oh, you are captivated. I want to look at the camera with me if you want to have so you don't want to cause me issues. Uh, we want to make sure our wife knows how much we mean. Did you know if your wife came home from a stressful day and saw you cooking supper, or saw you washing dishes, Boy, I'm going to tell you what. There's children present. <laughs> we are built, created, designed differently. Uh, before I move on with this one, we used to have a youth intern here named Daniel Allen. Was when you're at church camp, we had a bunch of girls wearing shorts that were denim underwear, pretty much. Uh, shorty, shorty shorts, halter top shirts, wearing a tire they shouldn't be wearing. I'll say that. Uh, at the end of the campfire, the very first line says, uh, guys, y'all going back. I need to talk to you ladies real quick. And I'm like, what the heck is this? If you knew this guy, you were nervous whenever he needed to talk to somebody. So he says, uh, ladies, I want to let you know, have y'all ever seen a Ford Ranger for sale in the paper on the side of the road? You'll see a Ford Ranger. It's a cheap, easy truck. Anybody, everybody can get them. They're just one of the cheapest pieces of junk trucks that you can get anywhere and everywhere. Everybody, a Ford Ranger's everywhere. Have y'all ever seen a Lamborghini Diablo, which was his favorite sports car? Mine's an S and Martin V9. Uh, he said, have you ever seen a Lamborghini Diablo in a sale paper on the side of the road for sale? No, you won't. You know why? Because a Ford Ranger is a cheap, easy thing, and a Lamborghini is a classy sports car. Ladies, God desires you to be a Lamborghini, not a Ford Ranger, so don't advertise it today for sale. Woo! That got a Ric Flair for me, y'all. I'm going to tell you right now. If that makes sense, you think about it. Think about it. God designed you for a specific purpose and a specific reason. I have a friend named Kim Morgan. I love her with all my heart. This past Sunday, she posted that she was loving looking at all the homecoming pics, but some of you parents need to think twice about it before you buy those outfits for your daughters. And it got me thinking, y'all. God says to wear appropriate attire. Focus on the good deeds. God wants men to see you for your character, not your body. So don't leave open what he don't need to be known about. Can I just say that? I'm a man and I'll confess guys. I'm not trying to ruin your, your lookies later on. God designed you specifically. Second, he says that women need to learn in quietness and full submission. And this follows in that same line from the idea of worship. He's saying don't come in here and try to draw attention to yourself with your loud and elaborate clothing or your loud and elaborate mouth. Worship is meant for God. So you don't come into worship trying to be all loud. And from the very beginning with Judaism, Paul is actually giving them a compliment in this time period. In the early stages of Judaism, it discouraged women from learning at all. Women weren't allowed to get educated. They weren't allowed in certain aspects of the worship. They were discouraged from learning the Talmud or other Jewish texts. So Paul's instructions here on women should learn represented a shift from exclusiveness in Judaism to inclusiveness in Christianity. With that in mind, what does he mean when he says women should learn quietly and in submission? The God Thyra commentary offers a very helpful comment. It says the injunction is not directly towards directed towards a surrender of mind or conscience or the abandonment of the duty of private judgment, but that a woman should not attempt to try to be loud and absurd uh, in the authority over anyone in public. This verse is certainly not a gag order. Paul is not saying, ladies, you need to sit down and be quiet. No. What he is saying here is you need to be respectful to God in worship. I don't know if y'all have ever been in church services or seen church services where ladies 
are dancing around all over the place doing cartwheels and flips and falling out on the floor and doing all this other stuff. Every aspect of worship is to be organized. I'm not saying a pipe. You can laugh. We want you to laugh. You can clap. You can raise your hands and worship. You can pray with your hands like this all day long. But it has to be organized. Did you know that people often look at me and say, well, I bet you don't even believe in speaking in tongues. I do. But did you know scripture says if you don't have an interpreter for your tongue, then that's a sin? Because how do I know what is from you? Is from you or is it from God or the devil? There's no devil in me. Do you sin? Yeah, we're all sinners. There's no devil in me. Paul says be organized. Make sure that it flows. Do not draw attention to you. All the attention goes to God. There's no reason to draw from this passage a prohibition against women singing or leading or praying or doing children's stories or anything like that. The next thing he says is that women are to refrain from teaching or exercising authority over men. Paul gave a similar instruction actually to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, where he says the woman should be silent in the churches. Again, talking about not being obnoxiously loud and drawing attention to yourself and drawing attention away from God. For they are not permitted to speak or submit them, uh, or but are to submit themselves. Women are urged, even commanded, to teach other women. In Titus chapter 2, women are urged to teach other women, especially older women teaching the younger women, women teaching the children, and all that. Paul praises Lois and Eunice, uh, Timothy's mom and grandma, for the way they trained him, the way they brought him up. He never says anything about their dad or granddad. It was their mom and grandma who brought them to church raise them, who showed them God's way. Did you know there is no example in the New Testament of a female preacher or elder? Quietness is an important virtue, Christian virtue for men and women. God is a God of order. We've already said that. Paul, on a few occasions in his letters, discusses the importance of an organized, respectful, meaningful worship service. Not one that's all over the place with distraction after distraction, because those distractions pull our attention away from what God designs, desires us to be like. Those willy-nilly type services, you can say they're still with the Holy Spirit as you want. However, me paying attention to them over here is distracting from me paying attention to him up there. Our attention, our focus is God and not only. But why must the women remain silent? Why are they not permitted to teach or have authority over men? Upon what reasons did Paul base these directions? Was he arbitrarily handing out these assignments to men and women? Did he have a hidden agenda against the ladies? No. The next few verses actually draws it in a little bit better for Verses 13 and 14. For Adam was born, was born first, then Eve, and Eve was not the one to see, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became the sinner. Paul's first reason for the distinctive roles comes from the establishment of creation. Note that Paul didn't appeal to a culture or custom or male leadership or what's going on in the world today or what we think or how it was applicable then, but no longer applicable now. The very beginning of God's creation, the very start of humankind, the roles Paul spelled out here are a product of God's fundamental design for Adam was born first, then Eve. There's more involved here than a chronological priority, as I mentioned earlier in the sermon. Paul brings back how from creation, God designed it, God said it this way. Does that mean men are inherently better and more spiritual than women? Heck no. I will promise you that ain't true. But in God's sovereign wisdom, he made the human pair in such a manner that this is how he desires we be. To those who would say that that's not fair, well, might I also point out that Jesus himself chose 12 men to lead. And in the 12 tribes of Israel, this is a fair with the 12 tribes of Israel. We said earlier that one of them was to serve in the temples. No one else was allowed. But that's not fair. You're right. You're right. It's not. But that was God's design. In the same way God made this choice when he created man first for men to love and to lead. And for the ladies to hold them accountable, because men for years have failed in this. Men, uh, Paul's second reason for the distinctive roles is because uh, confirming by the fall. When we think about the fall, we usually think of the connection with Adam. But actually, Adam bears responsibility for the fall since he was the head of the human race. But we need to keep in mind that he didn't fall first. He did. 
when Eve got out from under the protection of Adam's leadership and she attempted to deal independently with the enemy, she was deceived. And before anyone can think or say this, Paul brings this up by saying God's design, God designed this, and it's been this way since creation, showing how it had nothing to do with culture of the time, so that it's not a temporary instruction. The reason for God's command was not culture, but the very creation and fall of humans. Paul then moves on towards uh, from God's design to this level uh, to celebrating the vital roles that ladies play in the world and creation. In verse 15, he says, "But she will save; she will be saved through childbearing, and if they continue uh, in faith, love, and holiness with good sense." What exactly does Paul mean that women are saved in childbearing? Well, we know the salvation that Paul is talking about is not. Uh, from childbearing. Women don't earn their way into heaven by bearing children. That is not what he's talking about. He's talking about how women will save the world by continuing generations to come. Women are continuing to add to the human race. Moms have a profound impact on the life of their children by teaching them, raising them, loving them, giving them faith, and holiness. More moms sit down and read scripture with their children than dads do. And even if a mom never births a child of her own, she can still love others by adopting them in their heart, by teaching them the way of God. I cannot thank God enough for the godly spiritual women of our congregation who fulfill their important distinctive role in the church family. You are a gift. You help to make us complete, healthy, and strong. And as we finish up this morning, let me give a final word to men, to women, and to everyone. Men, these role distinctions are to be gently respected not exaggerated, expanded, nor exploited. This passage does not give men a license to dominate anytime, anywhere. Men are to be servant leaders who lovingly lead as Christ loved and led the church. Christian author Charlie Shedd said, your woman will respond to your manly as well if you never forget she's your woman. Men should recognize and rely upon the wonderful string of insight, wisdom, strength, sensitivity, and creativity of women. Women are so gifted and have so much to offer. Men, step up and be what God designed you to be. A loving leader who sets the example in life, faith, and love for his sons and men. Now ladies, your positive response to this instruction will help the church maintain its distinctiveness. As followers of Jesus, don't take direction from society. Don't allow your emotions to get the best of you. Don't allow society to say that that's sexist and wrong. It's God's design, His character, His holiness, His word, His will, regardless of what the world says or does. Godly women should embrace and flourish in their God given distinctive roles. God designed you so perfectly. Don't mess with you, with, with, don't mess with what He created you to be. Because He created you just right. And finally, a word to everyone. God designed you with a specific, specific purpose. East Coast people get it too. God set you apart with certain abilities that no one else has. Just like the kids' church lesson with that puzzle, you fit it perfectly and the design that God has. He needs you just as you are. He desires you to follow his plan, not question or tweak it. If we have a problem with what Paul wrote here in 1 Timothy, our problem is not with the preacher, it's not with Paul, but with the Holy Spirit who guided him with the life. God is the designer, creator, and sustainer of all things, and therefore it's God's right to decide the best way for you to flourish inside and outside of the church. Listening to the opinions of this world leads to further confusion and conflict, while listening to the Lord leads to order and peace. Let's choose to follow God. As Psalm 119, 103 says, How sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. May we enjoy the sweet, holy word of God without kicking the bees' nest or stinging one another. Let's live a life of gratitude in His perfect design. God help us. Father, we come to you right now as we get ready to uh, enjoy a time of communion. Lord, we cannot thank you enough or praise you enough for designing us as you saw fit. 
Father, I thank you that I know that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So, Father, each and every one of us, we come to you right now and we ask you to help us get out of our way. And we follow you and only you.